from the BBC World Service. These attackers have no fear. They would have killed me had they found out. It was really intense. I just saw the entire financial markets grinding to a halt. This is what they've stolen. So many millions of dollars. Oh, it's got to be North Korea. There was chaos. What do you mean they've disappeared? It was almost like a perfect crime. Where did they get the money? How in the world did this happen? The Lazarus Heist from the BBC World Service. Coming soon. Hello, I'm Nuala McGovern on the BBC World Service and this is BBC OS, Conversations on Coronavirus, Surviving Isolation. Single parents in the Philippines, the US and the UK shared their experiences of loneliness, both the positives and the challenges of constantly being with your children during a pandemic. Working was a huge issue. I'd try and organise calls outside of my daughter's lessons, but on a couple of occasions, she'd push angry notes onto the door. I don't like it when you're on the phone. I don't like it when you're on a work call. (laughs) The outbreak of COVID-19 has changed all our lives, especially the ease with which many were able to travel, not just locally in the form of lockdowns, but also around the world. Some countries have closed their borders, others have restricted international travel or brought in a quarantine system where people arriving from abroad must isolate in a hotel for a period of time. And this can range from just a few days to up to two weeks. Here's a message from someone who is currently quarantining. Hi, my name is Laura Toferides and I am currently quarantining at the Crown Plaza Hotel in central Auckland in New Zealand. We have a pretty big room here. It's got a nice big window where we can look up at the Sky Tower and people watch the builders 23 storeys down. So that's quite fun. That's mostly what we've been spending our time doing. The food is pretty good, I think. They drop little paper bags outside our door. Theoretically, we should be able to go outside to have a walk in the car park, but because 15 people on our plane have since tested positive for COVID, 90 people in this hotel have now been identified as close contacts of the people on the plane, and we are two of those close contacts. So we are awaiting COVID tests to identify whether or not we also have COVID, and if that's the case, then we will be moved to a different facility. Obviously, this is quite worrying. Since being in the hotel, I've developed a sore throat, which is obviously a bit of a concern given that other people on the plane have got COVID, but I've told the on-site medical team and they have arranged for us to have additional COVID tests and they said that we can order things from the pharmacy and they will have them delivered to our room, which is really useful to know. Hopefully it will be a negative test because I really don't want to have to move to another facility. Laura in New Zealand, and let's hope Laura is doing okay in her quarantine. Well, in order to get a more in-depth idea of what it's like to quarantine, we brought together three women who are in the same boat as Laura. They are Charlotte, who's from Australia, but is in a hotel in New Zealand. Charlotte's had to quarantine for 14 days. She was on day three when I spoke to her. Also, Michelle on her 11th day of quarantine in Brisbane, Australia, after travelling there from Northern Ireland, where she is originally from. And first, Amanda. She's Danish and usually lives in Malaysia, but is quarantining in Jakarta, Indonesia. There, you only have to quarantine for six days. And Amanda was nearing the end of her stay when we spoke. Uh, You'll hear her first with a brief taste of how she passed some of her time at the hotel. Think of me. Think of me fondly when we said goodbye. Remember me once in a while. Please promise me you'll try. I got a medium-sized room because I did want it, want a little bit more space. Of course, it's a little bit extra money. But it's definitely been worth it because I've been able to sort of move around a little bit. And I've got a huge window, which I get natural light from. So that's great. 
and then there's this like yard that we can go down. It's of course monitored. So like making sure people are wearing masks and keeping their distance, but actually it's, it's quite nice to just, if you need to come outside a little bit. And in terms of the food, we can order food from outside. That was very important to me because they kind of just bring you food three times a day and you can't really choose from a menu. It's cold and it's not ideal but you know whatever I'm a vegan as well I'm also a vegan and the food here at my hotel has been fantastic like really surprising actually before I came over I read somewhere that someone was served a bun with lettuce and cucumber for their vegan meal and I thought oh gosh I hope I don't get that but the chef called me and arranged vegan alternatives and I'm really Mm. fortunate as well because everyone quarantining at the hotel that I'm at is also from Australia, so we're considered low risk. And we have been given wristbands and a card to leave the room for fresh air so we can go for a daily walk. And it hasn't really hit me that I've been locked in just yet. It's just kind of new and it's a bit of a novelty being in a hotel and being looked after and having food delivered and, yeah, that kind of thing. I don't have any outside time. We're not allowed to leave our room and I don't have a window to even open or I don't have a balcony. So that's really, that concerns me. I like fresh air. I'm an outdoors person. I'm usually out every day. The food here is quite questionable. Three times a day we get our delivery and the door knocks and you have to wait 10 seconds before you can answer it. You have to answer it with a mask. Sometimes it's just warm not warm enough but you you can't choose what you want to order it's just a set menu so michelle um do you have any suggestions for me in regards to coping with boredom loads okay so (laughs) so i've been watching a lot of netflix especially the first couple of days getting over the jet lag also Mm -hmm. spotify i've been dancing and singing around the room like a silly person (laughs) I've been listening to quite a few podcasts. I have a few books as well. You know, if you have any emails or phone calls to do, just get them all done and enjoy your time. Anything else you'd like to add, Amanda, perhaps, uh, to help Charlotte get through the next 10 days? Before coming here, I scheduled already lots of calls, like FaceTimes with my friends from around the world that I needed to catch up with. So I have someone to talk to every day. Really what's been like my saving grace because I'm a yoga instructor as well. So I do like to move my body and things. So I have a little space here next to my bed where I can like do my yoga. But also I'm like you, Michelle, like I've been dancing and I've been singing just because I need a little fun in my life. And I wish I could say I was a big reader, but I am more of a Netflix kind of gal. So that's what I've been doing. Yeah. Would it be okay to maybe run through? I know everybody has different reasons and backgrounds of why you needed to travel. Michelle, I think yours is a little sad, so I apologise for asking you. No, that's okay. My reason for flying back to Ireland from Australia was that my mum became quite sick quite fast. So I had to go home. I just had to be there for her and everything. She was slightly improving as I had to leave. I was home for seven weeks altogether. It wasn't nice leaving, but I'm kind of stuck between two worlds. I've got my two young children who are in Melbourne who obviously need me. And my husband has been holding the fort. Let me turn to you then, Amanda. What took you to the hotel? I actually went to university in Glasgow in Scotland. And when I graduated two years ago, I came back home. Home meaning Malaysia. My parents, they still live there. And then I kind of got stuck because of the whole lockdown and COVID. But as a yoga instructor and I'm also a singer and a performer, I want to move back to the UK at some point, but at the moment, still the theaters and the industry is closed. And so in the meantime, for a few months, at least, I uh, got a special visa to go to Bali and work on my yoga as an instructor, as a yogi. So I'm trying to just make the best out of the situation. Going there to do yoga sounds amazing. And we've all read Eat, Pray, Love, right? (laughs) But let me turn to Charlotte. Charlotte, tell us why you are in that hotel right now. I met my partner, who's a Kiwi in New Zealand, while I was traveling the North Island in 2019. 
And for a while we did long distance and we went back and forth between the two countries. And then in January of last year. Between Australia and New Zealand. Yes, that's correct. And then um, last year I moved over to New Zealand to be with him. So just before Christmas, I wanted to go home to see my family because it was such a tough time being away from them for so long. So basically I got stuck back home and it's only been until now that I was able to return to New Zealand. I mean, New Zealand and Australia, I think they were probably among the first to kind of have the quarantine hotels and I think probably among the strictest uh, lockdowns. But when you go to New Zealand then, there's so many of our listeners that are in places that are with severe restrictions, lockdown surges, etc. And I think it might be interesting for them to hear what sort of world awaits you when you do get out of that hotel and go to see your partner. Life in Australia and in New Zealand is pretty much the same. It feels basically like there's no COVID-19 at all. We're still able to work and, you know, go to the gym and do everything that we would normally in our day-to-day life. It's fantastic. Wow. That's really quite something to think about. (laughs) Amanda, you were talking about that yoga workshops, et cetera, are continuing in Bali. So do you know what the picture will be like there? Yeah, it's going to be very similar to um, Malaysia. We've had this rule of having masks and social distancing since the whole start of lockdown. So anywhere public, you know, where you're sitting, dining in or whatever, you have to keep distance. You have to wear masks. They take your temperature. You sign in wherever you go. So you can still go to classes. But of course, there's a maximum capacity and gyms and things are open. But again, it's all about being smart and sanitized and distant. And um, they have a curfew as well, actually, in Bali. So there's no like partying going on at the moment, which is fine for me because I'm not there for that. It's a completely different world. Being back home in in Ireland in the lockdown and especially in winter in the cold months. But I could see the difference. I could see the impact that it was having on, you know, other family members and especially with kids. And me knowing the fact that when I go back to Australia, it almost seemed unfair. I almost felt a little bit of guilt coming back here because everything is so open here. You know, I'm coming back to the sun, beaches and, you know, I can go out and walks and hikes and everything you know it's it's just so different michelle quarantining in australia amanda in indonesia and charlotte in new zealand the pandemic and the resulting lockdowns have been a challenge for many parents across the world in some cases it's been juggling homeschooling parenting and working from home while also keeping your children safe If you're a single parent, of course, all of these responsibilities fall solely to one person. So we brought together three single parents to share what the last year has been like for them. They are Floyd, who's a theatre artist and singer in Manila in the Philippines. He has a 10-year-old son. Kate is in New Hampshire in the US. She's bringing up her two younger children on her own. And Shari, who works in public relations and lives in the UK and has a seven-year-old daughter. Well, it's been a bit of an emotional roller coaster, as I'm sure it has for everyone. It often feels more magnified when it's just you and your child and there's no one else to absorb any of your frustrations. (laughs) Obviously, one of the biggest challenges in the first lockdown was homeschooling and having to divide yourself in so many parts, do everything for schooling, obviously, but then also you're being a cook, housekeeper, friend playmate for your child with no one to support you and then of course navigating that with your co-parent as well. Let's turn to Floyd in Manila. Tell us your situation and how the past year has been. It's basically the same as (laughs) our friend here from the UK. It's like I'm a superhero (laughs) because I'm because I'm doing everything from housekeeping to home but we've been homeschooling for the last three years, so it's not much of an adjustment for us. He normally gets to see his mom every now and then, but but now since it's pandemic, it's she's being with me all the time. But I'm not complaining. Let me turn over to the United States, Kate. Now I understand you've got a times two. You have twins that you've been single parenting. You have another kid I know who's older who doesn't uh, live with you now, who's twenty. But these twins, yeah. tw- eight years of age. 
you're hearing Floyd, you're hearing Sherry, what are you thinking? It's the same situation. I mean, especially at the beginning, I think, where everything was so unknown and the anxieties that came with that, especially co-parenting, and then not knowing the outside world, what was going on. Everybody was going through the same thing, but feeling so alone at the same time. You know, there was a lot to learn. There was a lot that with homeschooling, we had to get grasp that. I was working from home. So, you know, I was there all the time, but I wasn't there. You know, some days they were eating ice cream out of the pint for lunch. And I was like, oh, is it lunchtime? <laughs> um, but, you know, I think it was just the anxiety of knowing that, you know, you're alone. And, you know, what happens if you get it? You know, if you get COVID and you get sick and you're so sick and no one can take your kids and you still have to be there. And those were the big anxieties for me. Everybody ex obviously experienced some element of isolation. The whole idea was we were supposed to isolate. But I think aside from the physical isolation, I had a real problem. A lot of my other friends with children, if they had a partner and they had other children, they didn't really understand things from my perspective. They'd say things to me like, you're so lucky. You've only got one child. You've only got one person to take care of. I have a family of five. They didn't understand that there's no let up, there's no break. Even if they do play by themselves, you have to catch up on your work, anything else around the house. And that made me feel even more isolated, the lack of understanding and that I wasn't really seeing my story being reported on in the media. Everyone talking about loneliness for old people and people who live alone. Those are big issues. But what about the single parents? And working was a huge issue. I try and organise calls outside of my daughter's lessons but on a couple of occasions she'd push angry notes onto the door I don't like it when you're on the phone I don't like it when you're on a work call um, thoughtfully she was quite kind to the environment she'd recycle her notes and use the same one the next day but um <laughs> It was, it, it, it I'm was sorry, very I'm sure it was terrible, but she's pretty funny. Oh, no, funny. I had to laugh, too. I had to laugh, too. <laughs> I must have bought a million art craft kits off of Amazon in, like, those first two months just to keep them <laughs> occupied while I was working. And it still didn't work. You would punch out and then just work later. That was the hard thing. There was no Amazon. shut off. It really is 24-hour. And it's also, when you're both cooped up, together you feed off each other's moods and that can be really positive when you're able to enjoy a really light-hearted moment and you're interacting and you're enjoying but when you wake up you're determined to be positive that day to get as much out of it as you can to make the best of it when my daughter if, if she woke up for whatever reason on the wrong side of bed or she didn't like what she was being asked to do I wasn't able to resist her mood as well as I normally could. We just mm -hmm. react to each other and it, it can become quite negative. You have to really motivate yourself to get out of those more down situations. Let me turn to Floyd. I think you had yeah. um, a solution, shall we say, to bring somebody <laughs> else into the family, uh, for want of a yeah. better term. So what I did was I bought a Shih Tzu. <laughs> His name is Hatch. So, so my son can have uh, someone to, to talk to whenever I'm, I'm out for work. But my son would say, but he can't talk back to me. And, <laughs> so, and I said, at least you can play with him. How did that did. work out? He realized that uh, it's a lot of responsibility to be a parent. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, I told him, uh, it's, it's, it's a dog. What more if you have a, like a human person, a human being to care for it? Sometimes when things get frustrating, I just go to the bathroom and, and cry. Because <laughs> uh, same with, with our two friends here from the US and, and the UK. It's magnified, the, the, the fact that we are isolated or being alone away from, each, from other people. So sometimes I just cry it out. <laughs> But what about that point? And maybe I'll start with you, Kate, but Cherry, feel free to jump in then as well. Crying in the bathroom that Floyd mentions. Yeah, there was moments of that. I mean, thank God for locked doors sometimes. But, um, you know, there were those moments where you had to just walk away and just, you know, be yourself for five minutes. You know, social media was a big part, you know, being able to keep track of my friends and their kids and just knowing you weren't alone. I mean, that helped, you know, venting to other moms and dads. And we all had kids in the same school, some of us. So it was, you know, 
back and forth and, you know, just getting the laughs from where you could. But it was hard with family. You were just calling people, just trying to, you know, just express I'm tired and I don't know what to do for them. And just having someone pick you up, you know, when you needed it the most, just knowing you had to do that eventually just reach out and just say, I need help. I need someone to just talk me off this ledge for a minute. I learned to talk to my kids about it. I learned to say, mommy just needs five minutes, five they just learn to take that. I mean, I think they saw strength and weakness and, you know, just as we would, you know, in any situation, but this one being, you know, magnified, but I learned to talk to them about it, that, you know, mommy needs to do this one project for work. It will take me an hour and then I'll do this. It was a whole new conversation to have with, you know, at that point, seven-year-olds, knowing they're going through exactly the same thing. They're missing out on friends and they're missing out on family and they're missing out on school and social interaction, just having a structure that became more important than almost anything else during the whole pandemic was making a structured day. Shari? I felt strangely much calmer when we went back down into lockdown and and the schools closed for the second time because there was more teaching online and I could escape for half an hour here on there to get work done during the day as well and, you know, to restore my sanity as well. One of the things when people ask, how is your lockdown? I think we naturally turn to the things that maybe we were worried about or that didn't work so well. What was a positive thing to come out of the lockdown for you? I'll jump in. So the positive things were, um, I think we figured out how strong we really were as a unit. And I also realized, you know, my strength as a parent. I'm an older parent. I'm 46 and my children are eight. So (laughs) some days it was really tiring, but I learned a lot of things about me. I changed some stuff. I did some plumbing. I learned a lot of things I can do. But then I also learned as a unit, the three of us, if the three of us are on, we're really good together. You know, some mornings and some afternoons and some evenings aren't as great, but we still get through them. And the next day we wake up and we try again. I gained like 30 pounds. <laughs> and so sometimes um, I would think that, oh, I've abandoned myself. But then you would hear your son say that you're still the m- most man I've ever seen in my life and everything is okay already. Aww. And Aww. Uh, yeah, it's so sweet. <laughs> and then I've learned that we can just sing it out. Whatever, whatever we're feeling, we can just sing it out. My son loves to sing. And so what we did was we, we did a lot of videos of us singing together. And we also did this streaming app in, in here in the Philippines. And it's also a profit earning venue for us. Give me one song that you guys used to sing together. He's here. Do you want to hear us sing? Yeah, <laughs> Just I do. a few lines? Yeah, that'd okay. be lovely. JD. His name is JD. Say hi, baby. Hey, JD. Hi. Can we sing? I'll be there. Okay. You and I must make a pact. We must bring salvation back. Where there is love, I'll be there. I'll reach out my hand to you I have faith in all you do Just call my name And I'll be there Beautiful. We have been treated to some wonderful voices this week during our conversations. And that was 10 year old JD singing with his equally talented father, Floyd, in the Philippines, who was speaking with fellow single parents, Shari in the UK and Kate in the US. And it's been great to hear how, despite the challenges, everyone has worked so hard to be positive. I'm Nuala McGovern, and this has been BBC OS Conversations on Coronavirus, Surviving Isolation. Thank you for listening. There will be more from the documentary podcast soon. If you haven't already, please do subscribe. And don't forget, do try our other BBC World Service podcasts too.